And so when you're talking to those customers that are upset, it's, it's getting a handle on their energy, like where are they coming from, right? The people that are in the, on the front lines that are managing that relationship, they are well trained and they are well equipped and they're a resource to be able to make good decisions as frontline personnel. And one of the most obvious ways to handle a customer complaint is just ask the question, right? Ask the most blindingly obvious question. What are you hoping I can do for you? Everybody wants to feel understood. Yep. Everybody wants to feel understood. And, and, and to your point, uh, you know, Russ and I talk about this quite a bit in our training and coaching, and uh, coaching ride-alongs especially, uh, as well as coaching with technicians as, as well as CSRs, is that it's not even gender-based, right? It, it's masculine and feminine energy, right? Because we all have both in us. Right. And, and you know, we, we, we get sick as men, we probably go wicked feminine on the, en on the energy level, right? <laughs> I just reminds me of that video. I've seen that video. It's what are you drinking over <laughs> No, no. There's a video of this guy with the flu and how guys are with the flu. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. oh, don't even touch me. You know, women are like, they've got the flu and they're taking care of the kids. They're going shopping. This. Right? <laughs> they, they, they get through it. And, do, and, dudes, and dudes get sick. It's like, oh, don't touch me. I can't move. Don't talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> We're kind of weak when it comes to exactly. that. Exactly. And uh, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's, in the ener it's the energy. And you've got to sense the energy that, that any human being is giving to you in any given moment, right? and then adapt, adjust, and execute accordingly, right? And, and like Gary said, it's, it's more about how you make me feel. It's never about what I spend as a consumer, it's about how I feel about what I spend. We've all, we've all spent a lot of money on, on, on whiskey, right? Even here, and cigars. And some of us spent a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Right? HVAC's been good. Right? <laughs> and, and in some cases, we feel better about a, a, a certain purchase of, of a bottle of liquor than we do about another bottle of liquor, right? But it's, it's kind of funny. Today I was, we were talking about uh, how sometimes at a charity you'll pay more for stuff. Because, and we talked about me paying $2,000 for that bot bottle of Pappy Van Winkle a couple weeks ago. And you were like, but what was the value of us enjoying it? And you couldn't put it down. And how did you feel about what you did for the, the cause? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. You got to enjoy something, but yeah. someone benefited as a result, right? Yeah. And so you won on two fronts. Right. And, and somebody else won. I'm going to ask you real quick, as an aside here, have you ever read a book called The Celestine Prophecy? What? Celestine Prophecy? No, I have not. You ever read that? Mm -mm. It was written back in the 70s. Okay. And it's a brilliant little book. All right. And you were talking about the energy of people. And the, the whole, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a fictional tale of this guy going through his life and experiencing people with different energies. And, and exactly what you're talking about, that yeah. the energy in every situation, you kind of get that vibe. And if you listen to that, and so when you're talking to those customers that are upset, it's, it's getting a handle on their energy. Like, where are they coming from, right? Again, they all need to be understood. They all just need to, to feel like they're being heard. We all want to be heard. Yeah. You know? And if you do that, and you can diffuse people from so many difficult situations, you know, if they just felt heard. Yeah, so the, the training, uh, the, having an understanding from an ownership point of view, the philosophies of how we're going to do business. So not arguing with the customer, just philosophically, the customer's always right. The customer isn't always right. No, Most of the time, not. they're not. Right. But if you start the argument, you're, you're in a place that you're probably not going to recover from. So the, the training and development and the understanding of the team is, I think, one of the weaknesses in our trade. And I think we've got to do a better job as not only an organization, uh, EGIA, but also just working with contractors you know, day in and day out to make sure that the people that are in the, on the front lines that are managing that relationship, they are well trained and they are well equipped and they're a resource to be able to make good decisions as frontline personnel. And that's, that's definitely not something that I would say our industry is great at. Well, and, and, and one of the most obvious ways to handle a customer complaint is just ask the question, right? Ask the most blindingly obvious question. What are you hoping I can do for you? How, you know, what, what would, would it take to make you happy? What would it take what's to gonna, make, what's you gonna happy, make you happy? Right? And, and, I, and I have listened to contractor stories over the years. I, I, I know one contractor, they put a system in a customer's house and the customer was not happy with the system. They tried everything they could to resolve every complaint that she had. And her, her, the target kept changing. It got to the point when they finally, just, they finally asked the most obvious question, which was, would have been the first question they should have asked. Right. What's it gonna take to make you happy? And the lady, I, if, I, if I hadn't heard this myself, I wouldn't have believed it. The lady said, I hate my house, I'm looking to move. And he said, 
So if I bought your house, would that solve the problem? And she said yes. He bought the house. <laughs> and then he, That's he, commitment and to then, service And right then there. he flipped it and he sold it. That's customer right? service right and there. And she got, she got right out there. of the house. She, was not, she just was not a happy camper. Right? In another situation, I had a client that they sent a, a technician out to the house. Uh, the couple that lived in the house was looking to sell the house. And the, uh, the, the couple basically said, well, look, we're looking to just sell the house. We want you to just do an overview of the system and verify that the system is operational at this time. Right, so they did. A, they did a report of the system. They just put, you know, age, you know, 20 years, condition three, meaning old but operational at this time, uh, and um, that's what they wrote on the agreement. They didn't do any service. They did no maintenance because they weren't asked to do so. The couple sold the house, and of course, the ticket was included with the sales documents to the lady who bought the house. So the woman who bought the house had a problem with the boiler, uh, and the company came out. She called the company because the sticker was on the equipment. Company came out. And they said, uh, yeah, th this system is, is old. It's, it's, it's beyond, obviously, the cost and age of repair. Uh, you should consider replacement. She was not happy about this at all. She sued the company because she was a lawyer, yeah. right? And they went to court against the lady. They had their lawyer. She showed up for representing herself. And the judge threw it out on summary judgment, said, they did nothing. They, 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 they're, they're not at wrong here. They have, they're not at fault. They have no warranty implied or expressed or otherwise. You have no standing here. She appealed. He, so the, the contractor said to his attorney, what am I supposed to do? And he said, I'll tell you what. It's 4000 to settle, 10000 to win. What do you want to do? Right? So he settled. Again, sometimes resolving the complaint is is just go to the heart of the matter, right? What does the customer want to get rid of, you know, to get rid of this particular issue? And let me throw out two other ideas. Um, you know, sometimes when you go above and beyond and you can resolve a complaint quickly and easily, as we talked about, these people will do business with you again. I don't think it should stop there, right? I, I think go and resolve the problem. Put the new system in like you, like you were talking about there before. But why not send the customer the gift certificate to go to dinner? Right? You don't, don't tell them that it's coming, but just send them in the mail. Yeah, sorry for any inconvenience. Land yap. We, you know, South we, Louisiana, we call that land yap. Something, yeah. something extra. Something extra, right? Something you didn't anticipate, but we want you to think of us, you know, think well of us, and just send that to them. Uh, another great idea I got over, uh, over the years was when a customer does allow you that second chance. Sometimes you got to cancel an appointment because the weather you know, starts raining. You got to cancel service calls or, or whatever, and, or maintenance calls because of the weather and it's inclement, and the customer reschedules. So they give you, in essence, a second chance. Or you make a mistake and you recover, and they give you a second chance. So one of the greatest ideas I learned from a friend of mine uh, over the years was send a customer a letter saying thank you and send them a scratch off lottery ticket. Thank you for giving us a check second yeah. chance. Enclosed as a chance for you. That's a great idea. Right? And when a you know, customer might win another dollar or something like that, and they scratch well, off, and they go back it. and they get another scratch off, right? I appreciate it. You know, but some people have won you know, a few hundred bucks. Some people have won you know, a few thousand bucks. Hey, you told a story about the lawyer, so this seems like a perfectly appropriate time for an attorney's <laughs> joke. So a guy walks into the bar, right, and he orders a shot of whiskey. Good Canadian whiskey, like you brought down from Canada. And he takes a sip of his whiskey, he sets it down, and says, you know what? Lawyers are assholes. Guy sitting down at the end of the bar in this nice suit, reading this big book, looks up and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't appreciate that, pal. Don't, don't compare me with those guys. He goes, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were a lawyer. He goes, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Well, well, I'm, 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 I'm looking, looking around the table. Well, before, okay, you got your question, but I got, a, I got a question. I'm looking around the table here, and you and I seem to be back to the... The, uh, what do you call it? The Canadian uh, JP Weiser Canadian whiskey. C Canadian whiskey. Canadian. Right? Canadian. Not to be from Canada, the Great White the, North. Yeah, Great White North, right? You just want to tell this joke, don't you? No, but but it, it appears to me as though Gary has something different in his glass. Yeah, what are you drinking over what there, are you Gary? Gary? G-Man. That's a 50-year rum. Wow. It's uh, obviously it's neat. Uh, Dictador. Dictador is the rum. Okay. It's uh, from Colombia. Colombia. And uh, it's uh, definitely pairs nicely with the cigar. Nice. It's a little on the sweeter side. Got some caramel flavor to it. Mm. A little molasses. Definitely, uh, if you like rum, it's a very good rum. Uh, I would compare it to. How come uh, I don't have any of that rum? I wonder. I would compare that to uh, uh, Zacapa XO uh, or uh, El Dorado 21. Those, it's in that class. It's uh, it's a keeper for sure.
Dictador, 50 years. I do have a question for you, to both of you. So we're talking about these customers that can be kind of difficult to deal with. Um, where do we get the most chronic complaints from customers? Well, who are the customers that complain the most? The ones that got the great deal or the ones that paid full retail? The ones that get the great deal. Right. So that's something else we can think about strategically in our business. Most of those complaints and those unreasonable people are the people that beat you up on price and you wish you never, ever had them as a customer. Yeah, that's my father. <laughs> <laughs> love you, Dad. Yeah, no, I do. I love him to death, obviously. But uh, I've put uh, air conditioning systems in his house a couple different times uh, for free. And, uh, you know, when there's a technical problem or whatever, um, you know, the phone call comes in and, you know, it's, it's hey, this, this thing isn't working or whatever. And so I'll have one of my friends that's, you know, down in the Sanibel Island area go out and take care of it. And uh, inevitably, uh, even on the friends and family discounted price, <laughs> I get the call. And so he's not complaining to the contractor because he's, that's not who he is. But he's complaining to me. He's like, I can't believe the price that you guys charge for this. And I'm like, you got a $34,000 system for free and you paid $350 <laughs> for a contactor. I think we're good. I think we should be good. So the perspective of that customer is, you know, he, he's used to complaining. He grew up in an environment of the depression. Probably used to get in his way, too. Huh? Probably used to get in his way. Well, I think that's what happened. That's exactly my point is that people that, that press, a lot of times the businesses they Squeaky give wheel in, gets oil. And the squeaky wheel gets oiled. And so, um, and that, and, and I, I say that in jest. Obviously, I love my father to death. Yeah. But that, absolutely, I've told yeah. him at the kitchen table where we've had dinner on a Sunday afternoon and said, you know, I don't, I don't think you would be a do not sell in my customer list. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad's hanging in there. He's had, a, he's had a rough couple of years. Yes, he has. Himself, but he's, yes, he's, he's, he's hanging cancer. in there and, and had a lot of problems. Doing around. his thing. Happy to have him around. He's still kicking, he's still kicking around. He's doing pretty well, actually, yeah. considering all things. Yeah. So I think if we kind of recap this discussion, with difficult customers, the, the, the number one thing I hear from both of you guys is have empathy and understanding for the customer situation, right? And try to respond in, in that way, understanding them as a human being, and, um, and then look for opportunities to make the situation better, obviously. Do something extra they weren't expected uh, or weren't expecting to do. And, uh, and then don't settle the cheap customers. Well, and, and another great, great point, you know, we talk about it all the time. You know, culture is everything, right? And you have to have the culture, you know, in your mindset as the owner, the operator, the leader of this organization, that you believe, you know, that you're out to give the customer the best experience possible. And that you believe, you know, customers want to see you succeed. And that you instill in the, your salespeople and your CSRs and your, your technicians uh, and, and installers, the customers want you to be successful. They don't want you to fail. I mean, if you th really think about it, they want to be your raving fan. They want to see you be successful. Because if you're successful, then they get a successful result, the outcome. Because that's really what, what it is that they want. Now, let's suppose in some cases it doesn't happen. Because we've all had that. And we get to a point where there is a point of unreasonable, right? Because like Gary said, is the customer always right? No, they're not always right. But at some point, you get to a breaking point and you have to say, what's it going to take to make you happy? And they say, you know what, I, I want you know, that $500 repair for $250. I, I just don't think it's worth what you guys are charging, this, that, and the other thing. Whatever they say. And I will say to them, if that's what it's going to take, that's what I'm willing to do one time. We will go ahead and mark your file that we've given, have, go ahead and given you the customer courtesy discount this one time. We hope that you will use this again. If you use this again, understand that our pricing policies will be in place from this point forward. But we, we always give every customer the benefit of the doubt. We'll give you a one-time you know, uh, gesture, to, and I'll mark your file that. We hope you will call us back again. We hope you'll think well of us enough to, you know, to give us another chance in the future. By the way, on an unrelated note, uh, how beautiful is this Colorado evening? It really doesn't get any better than this. This is beautiful. Be like 75 I mean, you're from the Northeast. Degrees, you're from the Southeast. Humidity. It's beautiful out here. Yes, it is. Hanging out with good folk. Yeah. Yeah, I love Colorado. Got a good cigar. I came up here when I was 23. Yeah. That was 32 years ago. I never left. Now, part of that time, I couldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but even when I had a chance, I stayed. <laughs> Sometimes you're a guest. <laughs> of the state. Of <laughs> the state of Colorado <laughs> and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But that's a long story. There's a book written on that. We can check that out sometime. So. Any of the comments, guys, about uh, customer complaints, customer issues? A lot of good 
wisdom you guys are just like spreading out like magic pissy, hey, pixie dust. Hey, if it weren't for the customers, wisdom. business would be easy. Yeah, if it weren't the customers <laughs> and, and, and employees, would be easy. I think you're in the customer service business. You got to anticipate you're going to have problems and you just got to train your people on how to deal with it and, and appreciate the idea that your pricing also, uh, we talk about this a lot in the pricing classes, but also our own company. You have to price to be aggressive at your customer relationships. What I mean by that is you have to have a high enough price that you can afford to be aggressive at your customer and client relationship. So if I have to acquiesce, I'm not worried about it. It's not coming out of my profitability in the sense that I can do what's necessary to take care of the client because my pricing accommodates the idea that I am going to take care of customers. Nordstrom's charges a lot of money for their product and services, but they do a great job. And so that's a business that's been around a long time. So if you look at the great companies, most of the great companies are the boutique higher price companies, but they're also great at customer service. And they have problems because we all screw up. That's not a, a question. It's going to happen. And so um, most of our industry is too low priced. And then what we do is we, we fight for the idea that we don't want to give up the margin you can't instead afford of to. just taking care of the client. Because now I'm going to put a review out there. And I just put a review out there this week on one of the hotels that are local here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't handle their business well. So it's, it's one of those things where um, it, they, they need to think about how they're taking care of their client and what their pricing looks like. If they're priced correctly, you can train. Right. And so a lot of our companies in our trade are not. That's priced. another conversation we've got to have about proper pricing because you're so right. When you have the company that sells on such skinny margins that the prospect of refunding eight or 10 or $15,000 could shock them in like, we can't afford it. Right. How could we give, you know, because they're operating on such thin margins. Companies that, you know, that maintain proper margins, proper profit profitability, they can afford to make that customer happy and do the right thing. That is yeah. correct. Yep. You know, and, and some companies- such a small percentage of your business, that doesn't hurt you. Right. right. I always look at those kind of situations. Plan for it. Put it, put it in your exactly. pricing. Put it in there that, you know, you, you're going to have to deal with some of that. You have a budget class come up at the end of the year. You will talk about this, because I've actually heard you talk specifically yeah. about that concept. You know, price in such a way that you can basically offer promotions and, and obviously you know, take a hit when you have to take a hit. Because it's not going to be a question if, it's going to be a question of when you have to take a hit. Somebody's going to come across that is going to be unreasonable. Yeah, if I'm going to start buying people's houses for problems, I'm going to have to raise my prices. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that once. That's a great story. We'll just end by saying this, like, uh, cheers to two of the fondest men I know. Cheers. cheers. To your 50-year old rum, and uh, let's do it again. Cheers. Great job, guys.